All right, everyone, we are back at the Boss Waterway Seaport again for our seaport stories. Um, we are starting our maritime history series tonight, and I have with us Jordan Hansen. I'm going to bring you in, Jordan. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so Jordan is going to be sharing with us tonight a presentation that he's done. This is a um, historical presentation about the history of sickness. Um, so without any further ado, I will send you over to Jordan. We're so happy to have you back again. Thanks so much for doing this, Jordan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Julie. It's a pleasure to uh, be here at FOSS waterway seaport virtually and uh i would say that um you know diseases aren't my favorite topic but they're certainly very interesting especially when mixed with the sea so uh let's get this thing started all right so yeah this um we got about a 30 to 45 minutes to cover an enormous amount of material uh, any one of these subjects could be a class Basically, it's impossible to separate the human history of disease and the history of ships in the sea. They intersect so many times, it's just impossible to separate them. So this is just gonna be a quick survey of uh, five major diseases that you probably don't think about too much anymore uh, between 1300 and 1905. So very quickly, um, my name is Jordan Hansen. I'm an author. I ran an, an adventure education nonprofit for 10 years called Or Northwest. Uh, through that, we rode across the ocean twice and down the Mississippi River twice and down the Columbia once. Uh, I got a BA in history and this is an inquiry-based adventure. And my hope is that this is going to provoke some interest in your end and that you guys might dig in afterwards uh, on any one of these in particulars that you find interesting. Uh, so I have a, um, lots of citations in this. And if you're interested in that, I will send those to Julie and she can make them available. So the scope of this is from the when the Black Death reached the port of Venice in 1340 to the last yellow fever epidemic uh, in the port of New Orleans in 1905. So I'm only just scratching the very beginning of the 20th century. So disease and sickness are a, as much a part of the human experience as uh, our experience with storms. Uh, we even use the weather of the sea to describe our shared experience. We weather storms of disease, dark clouds gather, and we de describe successive outbreaks as, as waves. So it's something about sickness in the sea is very fearful. And I think with things that are like that, uh, that we can't control, uh, we try and put a face to it. And so in the cases of the ocean, we call it Poseidon or Neptune and all kinds of names. And then lots of these diseases have names like yellow jack and king cholera, because the idea that uh, you know something so vicious almost needs to have a consciousness. But you know, diseases and the storms, like they're not things that are capable of evil. Uh, they're just are, and it's how humans react to it that is good or evil because we have the capacity to think and reason and decide uh, how we're going to react to the environment around us. So some of these things are going to seem absolutely obvious uh, considering what we know today, and that's the privilege of living today. Um, some of this is going to sound funny and ridiculous and simple. Uh, curing diseases takes a really long time because it's really hard for people to change beliefs. Uh, it's hard to convince people what's good for them. And knowledge is something that can be found and lost multiple times. So uh, we have this privilege to laugh and shake our head um, because we stand on the shoulders of giants. I know it's an overused phrase, but it's very true in this case. Um, all these people have gone through very terrifying things um, so that we can sit here and not worry about them. And it's really important to remember that all these people from history, uh, they're not stupid people. They're not simple or less thoughtful uh, or more thoughtful than anyone today. They were keen observers of the world around them. Uh, they loved like we loved. They hated like we hated. Uh, they feared. They were clever. And sometimes they acted stupid. And above all, for better or for worse, they acted like humans. And we have something to learn from that. So humans have gotten sick since before there were humans. Sickness is just part of you know, life. Sickness is terrifying uh, because it's hard to see. You just see the results of it. It's a, it's a lot easier to think of something like a shark that has teeth. Um, you can identify a sick person, but not exactly what happens. 
So I'm starting here uh, with tides and Newton. So uh, Newton was the uh, first person who was able to explain that it was astronomical masses that uh, created um, the phenomena of tides, gravity pulling and pushing uh, these uh, the water back and forth across the sea so that you have an experience of a boat sitting here floating at a certain time of day and then it's sitting there on the ground a little bit later. And so I wanted to touch base with this uh, with this guy because um, this is a scientist that experienced the plague uh, in the 1660s in England and he was in school, ended up uh, being quarantined and doing a lot of his thought uh, that led towards uh, his work, uh, his seminal work. Hey, Jordan, uh, we, just yeah. real quickly, are you sharing a screen? Because we're not seeing that. Oh, okay. Um, sorry about that. I thought I did. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. There it is. All right. Okay. Got it. Don't worry, we didn't miss much. So, um, yeah, so Newton was sequestered for um, a while, ended up doing a lot of thought. Uh, and I think the important thing to think about that is not that, you know, when you're in an experience like quarantine that you need to suddenly become Newton, uh, but you just, you do have to figure out how to cope and just keep doing the things that you were doing before in just a different creative manner. Uh, but I also wanted to bring this up because uh, what Newton represents is this um, kind of enlightenment thought, which led towards our understanding of the scientific method. And so uh, this is how a lot of these major breakthroughs have occurred is that people followed this line of thought. So the idea of uh, coming up with uh, an observation and a theory of how something works, testing it, having others test it and do that enough in order to prove it. And so this is a big part of all of these breakthroughs that we'll be talking about. So um, when thinking about uh, disease and the sea, uh, one way to think about this is uh, sailors were essentially the essential workers of their day. Any society that trades and trades by boat is going to have to have people to work those boats. And so that means that throughout uh, human history, it has been sailors uh, that have been uh, vectors for a lot of the, these diseases as they travel across the sea. And that also means that they were the ones that were that had really above average mortality rates because as they traveled around the world, they were exposed to a wide variety uh, of contagions and not a lot of protection. So we're gonna start in the 1350s with Black Death and we'll start far away from the sea in the deserts of Mongolia with a cute little marmot up in the upper right-hand corner uh, that is sometimes covered with fleas that carry uh, the plague bacterium on, the, on them. So uh, the people that lived around this area, they had some strategies in order to deal with these outbreaks uh, that would happen from time to time. And they knew kind of when to ignore these marmots. But uh, at some point, they, um, whether, whether or not someone wanted some marmot meat or they felt like that uh, cute little marmot fur would make some really good gloves, uh, it ended up on a trade route that eventually hit a port and uh, made its way over decades uh, from Central Asia uh, and eventually to the Mediterranean. And so at this time in the 1350s, you had a major power uh, of Venice, which had basically inherited a lot of the uh, leftovers from the uh, Byzantine Empire that used to be the Roman Empire. So it was a major maritime power. And it had to be because Venice is basically built on a bunch of lagoons and all it has to sell is fish and salt. So if it was going to become a world power, it just had to become um, a major trade destination. And so uh, trade was so much a part of what Venice was all about and their relationship with the sea was so close that once a year, uh, the leader of Venice, the Doge, would do a symbolic marriage to the sea and they would throw a ring into the sea. And I think they actually uh, still do this today. So, um, Black death, this uh, horrible disease that goes and attacks your lymph system, you get swollen buboes, uh, these big bumps uh, that are into your lymph nodes, so kind of in your thigh and underneath your armpits. Um, and eventually the bacterial load gets so great that your 
uh, immune system freaks out and ends up killing yourself. Um, you turn black, which is why it's also called the Black Death. Really nasty. So uh, it enters Venice and um, they have to figure out what to do. I mean, this is just raging across Venice and it's going to start raging across Europe, but they have to figure out a way to manage uh, this situation. And uh, they weren't the first persons, uh, first people to come up with the idea of separating uh, the sick, but uh, they were the ones that gave it the word that we use today, uh, which is quarantine. And so that is, would have been Venetian, uh, so kind of proto-Italian, uh, for 40 days. And so they picked 40 days because this is a, um, you know, everybody around the Mediterranean, as you have your Christians, your Jews, and your Muslims, they're all drawing from, uh, from basically the same stories. And 40 days is something that really resonates. So uh, when they decided to sequester people for 40 days, uh, that was something that people understood. And the fact was, is that it ended up working. So uh, in order to do this, they had these islands and eventually, well, one island that they called the Lazaretto. And there was the, uh, and then they had another island. So they had the old Lazaretto and the new Lazaretto. And this is uh, islands that were named after uh, St. Lazarus of the lepers in the, in the Bible. Um, and so the idea was these ships would come in, uh, they would offload the stuff, they would uh, fumigate, they would clean things with vinegar. They were doing everything they could to keep things as clean as possible uh, to their understanding. And within this 40 days, which people bought into uh, in a large part because this, they grew up with hearing that, that number, um, it worked. They were able to manage this. And so uh, Lazarettos and quarantine are things that have been uh, language that has been transferred all over the world um, because quarantines have been a, consistently a good way to manage these outbreaks. Um, and so another aspect of this is people that are sailors is there's a part of your uh, boat, if you have a boat that's called a lazarette, and it also comes from this. And so usually the lazarette is in the stern of the boat, uh, and it's a place where you keep things that are a little bit, can be a little bit wetter or dirtier. I never knew that. That is so cool. I have had a lazarette on every boat. <laughs> I did not know it was called that. <laughs> can you uh, also on your screen share, can you hit that hide pop up so we can see oh. a little bit more of it? That is such a cool oh. fact about lazarette. Let's see. I always thought that is such a nice sounding name for such a weird end back of the boat. There we go. That's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, no, so, right. Underneath it says StreamYard is sharing your screen and it says hide, stop sharing or hide. Just yeah, hit hide. I can't see my uh, my mouse right here. It's, oh. Yeah, it's, it's all lost in the black. Oh, so, well, I never mind then. We'll just leave it there. All right. Moving on to the fresh hell of scurvy. So <laughs> um, scurvy is, and again, you really have to put yourself in the mind of people of the day. So uh, let's say your option in life is to become a sailor. So there's a few known knowns uh, out there. You know that you're going to get in a ship of varying quality. Uh, it might rot or sink under you. Uh, you might have a horrible captain. You might have a good captain, but you also might have one that is an absolute tyrant. Um, if you are a merchant uh, or if you are a soldier or marine or sailor in the Navy, you um, you got to watch out for pirates or your job might be to go out there and actually start fights with other ships and basically shoot lead balls uh, at one another um, with cannonballs that will hit the sides of these ships. And they will send out massive two by four size splinters that will impale you. Uh, the food is terrible. On top of that, there are all kinds of storms. Um, and basically a ship is like working in a big wooden and rope and rope machine. There's drowning. Uh, it was really, really horrible. And on top of this, because you had no idea that you needed vitamin C, and for some crazy uh, reason, humans can't synthesize vitamin C, and we're one of the few mammals that can't. Uh, like rats, for example, can synthesize vitamin C. So they don't need, when their rats are on the ship, another horrific thing to think about. Um, you know, they don't have to worry about vitamin C, but humans do. And scurvy, again, we just don't think about how nasty this is, but basically the lack of vitamin C ends up causing old wounds to reopen. 
So your scar tissue breakdowns because because you, this vitamin C is a big part of the collagen uh, of these of your scars. Uh, your teeth fall out of your head. Uh, you start to get covered in these sores because your skin is starting to break down. And this all starts to happen uh, about, you know, after about 30 days. And so if you live on, um, if you live on land, chances are you have a, a reasonably varied enough diet in most cases to get enough vitamin C. Because again, you can get vitamin C from meat, um, animals that, that can synthesize this. But if you were out and having a very plain diet out at sea, after about 30 days, you start to feel this malaise. Uh, so they would uh, often, um, the conclusion that captains would come to is that laziness caused scurvy and not the other way around. Um, so your teeth would fall out, internal hemorrhaging makes your skin blotchy. Uh, and eventually, if it is allowed to go far enough, um, something hemorrhages next to your heart or your brain, and then you die. And so you don't know any of these things. You just know that after about 30 days, if you know you have a certain, if you've concluded that it is the diet, uh, that something horrific is going to happen on top of all the other horrors. So here's a description from a 16th century uh, um, surgeon that experienced this. It rotted all my gums, which gave out a black and putrid blood. My thighs and lower legs were black and gangrenous. And I was forced to use my knife each day to cut the flesh in order to release this black and foul blood. I also used my knife on my gums, which were livid and growing over my teeth. When I had to cut away this dead flesh and cause much black blood to flow, I rinsed my mouth and teeth with my urine, rubbing them very hard. And the unfortunate thing was that I could not eat, desiring more to swallow than to chew. Many of our people died of it every day, and we saw bodies getting thrown into the sea constantly, three or four at a time. You're not making sailing sound really very great. Like, it's just <laughs> horrific. So, uh, when was that from? This is from a lack of vitamin C. No, but what year? Like oh, about what time? 16, uh, this is 16th, 16th century. <laughs> uh, it's gross. <laughs> so basically, the reason this becomes associated with sailors so much, because this can happen to anybody, uh, is that this is the age of exploration. Starting out in you know late 1400s, for the next 200, 300 years, um, you know, there are a lot more people that are going out to sea for longer periods of time, and these ships are not very fast. And so people mm -hmm. are spending, spending, you know, two to three months at sea on a very consistent basis. Uh, but these people are, again, like people are clever and they conclude that if you eat certain things, certain things don't happen or don't happen. And so going throughout the history of this, you'll find, you know, certain captains or navies that put it together that, well, if you eat X, Y, or Z, then you don't have to deal with scurvy. But the first time this was really dealt with in a, in a very clinical way was a Scottish um, surgeon named James Lind working for the British Royal Navy. And this guy did the first clinical trial. So he had 12 sailors that were suffering from scurvy and he split them up into six groups. Two were ordered to a cup, a quart of cider every day. Two others took a 25 drops of an elixir vitriol three times a day. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, two of the worst patients were put on a course of seawater. That certainly didn't uh. help them. And then two others had uh, oranges and lemons every day. Mm. And then the two others uh, took something, an electory recommended by the hospital surgeon. Again, not sure what that is. So uh, almost immediately, the ones that had the oranges and lemons, uh, within a few days, uh, they were fit for duty and they were taking care of these other patients. Uh, and so this happens around 1750, but it's still, for it to really sink in, to uh, the, the British Navy, it really takes about like 40 years for it to become policy. But the problem is, is uh, lemons and oranges have a lot more vitamin C than limes, uh, but limes happen to be growing in, in British colonies, and so they were cheaper. Uh, they also, oh, they also need to preserve it, but if you boil, uh, by, if you boil uh, lime juice, then, you lose, then it loses its vitamin C. And so ships become a lot faster between 1750 and 1820, and things are just a lot more dialed in in general. And so uh, while they haven't identified 
kind of what causes scurvy, uh, they have ways to prevent it. That gets a little bit better as they experiment over the years and ship, uh, the trips on ship become a lot shorter. And so people end up back on shore having a more varied diet. Um, and so you get less and less of it, but it's not until, uh, the 1930s where vitamin C is, um, identified, uh, in regards to um, ascorbic acid, which means anti-scurvy. And it's not hmm. until 1939 when they're able to synthesize it. And that scientist ends up getting the, uh, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Why do you think it took so long? Um, you know, it's science moves as fast as science moves and sometimes it's quick and sometimes it's slow. Um, you know, you also have these sailors, they, uh, they, they're, uh, it was mostly happening to sailors and they really, mm -hmm. their lives weren't really considered that valuable right. uh, and they were very replaceable. So you see here the molecule of vitamin C, oranges, guinea pigs also can suffer from scurvy, which is random, but rats can't. <laughs> that is random. But rats can't? Yeah. So if you ate rats on the ship, then, um, well, you wouldn't get scurvy, but you might catch something else. <laughs> All right, so um, now we're going to go jump to smallpox. And so this is a very old affliction of humans, perhaps one of the, the oldest uh, ones that basically starts to happen. It needs a, a, it needs a population uh, of people. So this is something that would have developed over the last 10,000 years. Um, but it really starts getting identified a little bit, you know, within this last 500. And so uh, this is a horrific thing um, that we have managed to eradicate. There's a few samples left in the world right now, but it was in the 1970s. And the last wild case of it was in England. And uh, a doctor felt like he was responsible for it. And he blew his brains out um, because he felt so guilty. Uh, so this was a really big deal. Like smallpox was one of the afflictions of humanity. Uh, I think it, it's killed 10% of the people that have lived as long as we've known about it. Um, so, uh, basically what happens is you get fever, you get vomiting, you get covered with these small pustules that eventually fall off and scar. And that's if you're lucky. If you don't, it overwhelms your immune system and you die. Um, I'm not really putting up any photographs of these diseases, uh, but if you want to see the horror of that, just Google it yourself. Um, let's see. So, uh, let's see. Basically, the, what you see right here is Boston, but I'm going to go back a little bit earlier. Um, so in the age of exploration, we think of Columbus sailing the ocean blue, and that's kind of what sets this thing off. Um, now, between Africa, Europe, and Asia, you had a lot of these diseases that for about 10,000 years of human civilization uh, were just sitting there, like mixing back and forth on these known trade routes. Well. Uh, 15,000 years ago, you had the sea level was a lot lower and you had a Bering land bridge and a population of humans made its way over to North America. Sea levels uh, rose up again and uh, leaving them over here to uh, live. Uh, and they were able to stay away from all of these old world diseases for a long time. But once you started this contact, it was absolutely horrific. These people had uh, in North America and South America had no protection to any of these diseases. And so um, it hit them in waves upon waves upon waves, the horror of which I think is impossible to comprehend these days. Um, it was crazy. So, but it was just a consistent thing that would happen. And so here we are in Boston in 1721. And you have this guy named Cotton Mather, who is a really famous preacher in American history. Uh, and you have his slave, Onesimus. So Cotton Mather also makes a, uh, is also featured in the Salem witch trial. So this guy is super religious. He absolutely believes in witches. Uh, and he has this slave that's come over uh, and lives in Boston with him. Um, and then a British ship shows up, a naval ship from, uh, let's see, where did it come from? From, um, from Jamaica. And, uh, they had quarantined a ship the year before and avoided a smallpox outbreak. But the day after the ship arrives, a sailor falls sick. They quickly quarantine all of the sailors, um, but it's just too late. And so the waterfront erupts in smallpox. And so uh, Cotton Mather is talking to his slave and his slave saying, let's one seamless guy. He's like, well, you know, I'm not going to get it because I've, uh, um, 
he had been valorated. And so that I'm not sure if that would be the term that he would use, but basically uh, within a few hundred years before this, uh, between China and India and Turkey and would have made its way into Africa and was making its way into Europe about this time, they realized that if you were to ex purposely expose yourself to the virus, you had a much, much better chance of survival. And so one Seamus right here was someone who had been exposed to it. He had this nasty scar from it, um, but he was fine as this smallpox was sweeping through town. And so this is called valoration. And so it's this inoculation and it would happen in a variety of ways. You could powder up dried scabs and you could snort them. Uh, you could put a cut on your arm and then get wrapped to someone else's arm. Uh, and that would expose it as well. There's wide varieties. But the key factor here is that if you were valorated, then you had a one in 50 chance of dying. Uh, whereas if you, um, uh, if you were to get the disease naturally, uh, you had about a one in five chance of dying and sometimes a little bit higher. So it was absolutely worth the risk if this was going to, if this was going to consistently rip through your communities. So uh, here's this, um, this preacher who's talking to his slave, and he becomes this force for valoration uh, within the, this town of 11,000, this coastal port. And out of this town, over 6,000 people get sick. So that is more than half of the people get sick. And the people that are valorated have about a 2% uh, death rate. Uh, the other people um, have about a 20 to 30% death rate. And so this guy, Cotton Mather, keeps track of all this. And um, this is why between the Britain and the British colonies, valoration uh, was something that was well known and became very popular. And so very quickly, England developed a, England and its colonies developed a, a strong understanding of this disease. So here we go. Here's uh, some pictures of the uh, Native Americans suffering from... Um, Smallpox, you can see a picture there of just how horrible that is. And then this person right here in China getting inoculated uh, with the uh, with valoration. So uh, now we're going to go to the um, country of England, the uh, the countryside of England, where there's this country doctor. Uh, and let's see, his name is, why can't I think of it? Uh, Martin Lister. Okay. Lister. This is, yeah, Lister. Dr. Lister, I think. Sorry, I just lost the name of this guy in my notes. Uh, but anyway, he is a country doctor and he uh, notices and talks with a lot of other country doctors in this area. Um, the kind of local knowledge is that uh, a lot of these cows get something called cowpox, which looks like smallpox, but on udders. And um, the milkmaids who get it, uh, they don't need to be valorated. So they, uh, they would go and they would, in the course of their job, get cowpox. And then later they would uh, get valorated and the, they, would, they would never get sick. And so this isn't you know, just a single aha moment. This is something where there is a certain amount of local knowledge. Um, uh, but uh, this doctor ends up... Um, testing it and testing it and testing it, and finally proving um, beyond a doubt that uh, if they use this treatment, which he calls vaccination after the Latin word for cow, uh, that it's a lot more powerful than valoration. And so what this means is that if people are vaccinated instead of valorated, that means that the uh, smallpox virus could eventually get eradicated because the problem with valoration is that it would uh, the disease would still be working within the area. So you wouldn't be getting rid of the disease. You'd just be giving people a um, you just be giving people a, a less um, less powerful dose, but someone could still infect someone else and they would have the, the full dose of the virus. So this has been uh, oh, it's Edward Jenner, of course. Um, so this ends up traveling all over Europe, this knowledge. Uh, so he proves this in 1798. And what's going on in Europe at this time is that you have uh, this uh, dictator named Napoleon who's hijacked the French Revolution and is currently trying to take over all of Europe. And this is a, uh, however you feel about Napoleon, 
he was a brilliant tactician. He was quite the leader. Um, and right next to France, you have the Kingdom of Spain, which at this point is the Spanish Empire has most of the New World and all the way into the Philippines. And they have this uh, king that is not really, uh, they call him the hunter, uh, not because he's you know particularly vicious in any way. It's just that he likes to hunt versus actually running the empire. And he's kind of considered generally a simpleton. Um, but he, uh, his family was hit by smallpox. And so he was a huge proponent of valoration. And so right about the time he's uh, about to um, make it something, make uh, basically, valoration being something that everybody in the empire is going to have access to, uh, this new technology of vaccination uh, starts. And so he decides that there's going to be this vaccination. Uh, they call it the Royal Philanthropic Vaccination Expedition. And this is the first time uh, that a government has taken a technology out there just to go out and protect people from disease. Uh, so this is. Um, a really incredible first time experiment. And so the problem is, is that they have to get this uh, living virus, this cowpox, and they have to transmit it uh, across the sea. And so they're going to be out at sea for a long enough time that whoever has uh, cowpox is um, going to get better within this time. So they have to create a living chain of transmission. So they get 22 orphans and someone to look after them. And they inoculate, well, they vaccinate two orphans. And then as they're about to get better, they um, strap them up to the next two. And with that, in that way, they're able to keep this virus alive the entire way across the ocean. And so periodically they have to um, get more orphans. And so this sounds really horrible, and at a certain level it is, but this was really their only option. And they did make a lot of efforts for these orphans who otherwise didn't have very good prospects uh, should they survive, which they had a higher chance of if they were vaccinated. But if they also survive all of the other things that could kill them at sea, um, then they would get adopted by these wealthy families and the state would pay for their education. So uh, all throughout these former um, Spanish colonies, there's definitely a fair amount of people who could probably trace the lineage back to uh, these orphans that ended up um, through this process, which took three years, um, and not just the first 22 orphans, but however many more they had to pick to keep going uh, for three years, uh, they end up vaccinating over 400,000 people. And this is something that uh, Edward Jenner, the guy who comes up with this, sees in this lifetime. And so at the beginning of the 1800s, they're starting to see that they have the possibility, just the possibility that they could eradicate uh, this disease. And it takes up until the 1970s. So moving on to uh, cholera, King cholera. This is a nasty one. So this is a bacteria uh, and it's a relatively large one. Um, and uh, what this basically does is it gives you the, one of the worst upset tummies in the entire world. And you poop uh, what is described as rice water that smells like fish. And it can drain your body so fast uh, that it makes your skin blue and can kill you within a day. Um, so that's terrible. Um, this, uh, you know, again, it, this happens uh, endemically in India for a while, but uh, because of Britain's trade with India, it ends up getting brought over to uh, England at the beginning of the, uh, you know, they, they figure out smallpox right around uh, the beginning of the 1800s. And then they start dealing with cholera in a uh, few years, a few years after that. So what's crazy about this experience is, um, so the, uh, they knew that cholera was coming. England had a lot of investment in India. They saw that this was a problem over there and it was, uh, they saw what was happening. They knew that they couldn't control it, but they had these, they had things like quarantine and uh, how it gets established in England is the port of Sunderland, um, which is right in between Edinburgh and England. Uh, it decided that it did not, uh, it objected to the quarantine um, and uh, chose not to quarantine some of the ships coming in. And because of that, it made it to, uh, Edinburgh and London and ended up killing uh, 52,000 people. 
So um, basically, London was one of the richest cities in the world at this point. Uh, but it was a city that had toilets uh, that were very fancy and new, but it was going into a sewer system that was medieval. And so you had these uh, men that are referred to as nightmen or gong farmers, and people were basically pooping into their basements. That's where it would go. And uh, so think about that when you're in a basement in London, if that happens. Um, and then these gong farmers uh, who were getting paid three times the daily rates uh, of, of day labor um, would go in with shovels. And it was often uh, young boys as well. And they would scoop the poop. And then they would hopefully, you know, not tramp through your living room uh, as they're taking it to their gong wagons, where they would take it out into the countryside and they would sell the poop to the farmers to grow the food for the people back in the city. Um, and so you just had a big morass of things that was just really like the people were drinking poop water. And that's exactly uh, what happened um, in uh, this particular uh, part of um, London is you had a cholera outbreak. And at this point, you have to think of like how people are thinking about things because people just, they know what they know and they don't know what they don't know. So the assumption here is that sickness is caused by something uh, referred to as miasma and the miasmatic theory. And that's the idea that if it smells bad, it's going to get you sick. And so um, things like fog, things like smells, uh, a hot day, uh, you know, if you saw a fog or it was nighttime, bad air was something that people were deathly afraid of. Like they thought that these were the things that were going to give them the disease. Because at this point, uh, germ theory is just starting to be thought about. And so um, you have this uh, hotshot doctor here named uh, John Snow, Dr. John Snow, um, who is trying to treat this cholera outbreak. And he maps this whole thing out and he traces it back to the well. And he's telling uh, the city and he's telling these other doctors that like, I don't know how, but it's in the water. It's in the water. It's in the water. And no one believes him. And he finally is able to get a, a, uh, a police officer to take the handle off this pump and uh, stops the epidemic. So um, within a year or two, uh, nothing's really been done to address this. Uh, people, But people are starting to think of public health in a much broader sense. Um, at this point, they basically concluded that um, if you were poor, it was your fault. And that was a moral failing upon your part. And that was why you got sick. But cholera comes along and it doesn't discriminate. It kills a lot of people who are poor and wealthy. So uh, the other part of this is um, you have Parliament, which is right next to the Thames River. And so what you have to think of is London is on the River Thames, and because that London is a is a port city, you don't think of it so much as a port city today, but that's how it was founded, and that's what it is. And so this is the seat of the government of one of the most powerful empires in the world at this point. And the Thames River is full of poop, and it smells really, really bad. And all these people are operating under the idea that a bad smell can make them sick. And so this smell chases the lawmakers of England all over this giant, beautiful building uh, and basically scares them into doing a public works project that will take almost 20 years uh, that's based on bad science, but ends up being a pretty good cure for everything. So they get this engineer named Joseph Bazalgette, and this guy makes a modern London sewer system um, like all of which is still being used today. And they're able to um, basically separate uh, the drinking water from the poop water. Uh, and they end up curing um, or limiting the cholera outbreaks. And because at this point in time, like pretty much, you know, the rest of the cities of the world, we're going to follow London's lead. And so a lot of other cities, modern day sewers are based off of what they did in London and this gentleman, Joseph Bazalgette. So on to yellow fever, and this is a uh, another good one. Um, it's a hemorrhagic fever, and so you can see kind of what happens right here. You got your this dandy little gentleman right there who starts out normal, uh, gets fever, 
then he gets yellow and then he uh, starts to bleed out from the hemorrhaging. So you would turn yellow because it would attack your liver. Uh, and then eventually it would basically cause you to hemorrhage, more or less liquefy your insides. And um, this was something that uh, had, again, had been around a long time. Um, and, but really first starts to, it's a disease from the old world, uh, from Africa that was, came over here on the slave ships. And it had bounced around uh, the Caribbean a fair bit, but it really comes into American history in a really big way uh, in the port town of Philadelphia in 1793. And so you got to think of like what Philadelphia was in 1793. It was um, it was the home of the American Revolution. It was the seat of government. It was the place to be. It was absolutely thriving and just ripping along. This uh, seat of trade, uh, lots of amazing things going on there. Um, so the American Revolution happens, and then shortly after that, the French Revolution happens. And right on the edge of that, the Haitian Revolution happens because... Um, these Haitians who are a French colony decide that they also want to be free. And when France tells them that they can't, they form a revolt. And it ends up being very, very effective. And Napoleon sends 50,000 troops that all die. So you have to think about the logistics of that. Uh, that's a lot of ships to send a lot of soldiers over. And the Haitians do a really magnificent defense of their land, but they are greatly assisted uh, by yellow fever. And so uh, there's uh, within the port of Philadelphia, there's a there's a French uh, immigrant who's done very well for himself. And he sends this uh, he sends a ship down to um, help uh, the, his his countrymen that are refugees at this point. Uh, and they end up coming to um, Philadelphia and then yellow fever starts to happen. So um, this basically changes the course of Philadelphia's history. It chases away the government um, and they, um, you know, almost completely destroys the town. Uh, and it takes a long time for it to get back to normal. And it had to basically reinvent itself uh, after all this. And so at this point, yellow fever is firmly established on the North American continent. And nobody knows why this happens. Uh, but there, there's a few clues that are happening. Like this definitely happens in a season and they know that there's no more new yellow fever cases until like after the first frost. So that's pretty much what they're, what they're going on. So every, every uh, summer um, when, uh, when it starts getting hot, they start thinking about yellow fever season and maybe it'll hit this year. Maybe it won't. Nobody knows. So uh, in 1878, there's a particularly bad one that starts in New Orleans, which is a major port city connected to the Caribbean where yellow fever basically hops from place to place. Um, and every once in a while rears its ugly head in New Orleans. Well, so this is 1878. This is post-Civil War. And so at this point, uh, a lot of these technologies, there's way more river traffic and there's way more railroad traffic. And so this absolutely rips through the uh, it rips through the uh, uh, whole southern countryside, um, chasing tens of thousands of people away from towns. And it's particularly bad in Memphis. And what I want to focus on is, uh, again, thinking of uh, the people who stayed behind and these essential workers. And so these these nurses and doctors and, and at this point, it's not that organized. Um, they just really don't know how to treat anybody. Uh, so they're just doing what they can and often they're getting sick and, and dying themselves. Um, but again, this is all working on miasmatic theory. And one of the things that they felt like they had to do was to break up the bad air. And so imagine yourself in the middle of this horrific event and the sights and smells of this and the sounds so they're burning barrels of tar in the street. They're burning sulfur in the street. And then in order to break up the bad air, there is someone who would have considered themselves and everybody else would have considered them an essential worker whose job it is to run the cannon crew that is firing a cannon over the swamp to break up the bad air. So there is this crew of people and there's everybody in the city that is hearing the sound of this cannon and they're thinking 
that it's doing something to to save everybody. Uh, and that just boggles my mind just to imagine uh, this place that um, not only is everybody dying all around you, it smells like sulfur and toxic fumes. And then there's a sound of a cannon in the background, just randomly firing over a swamp. It's, I don't know what level of Dante's hell that is, but it's one of them. So uh, what you see here is you see a little riverboat right there. And then uh, after this, uh, New Orleans invested a whole lot in their whole quarantine situation. And so they, they ended up not having an outbreak in a very, very long time. But this is really important uh, because this was something they considered the, the pride of the world. And they would heat things up. They would you know, scrub things down really, really well. Um, and they really felt like they had this dialed in going into the next century. Um, but they didn't because they didn't know how it worked. So uh, at the end of this century, Spain, which has been an empire for 350, 400 years at this point, uh, it's getting old, it's getting tired. Uh, it's been gradually losing territory for the last 100 years. And one of the last outposts of this is the island of Cuba. And uh, they have a, the Cubans are having a revolution. Uh, the U.S. has a lot of interest down there and decides it's going to get involved. So it knows going into this that yellow fever is going to be a big deal. And there had been a physician in Cuba named Carlos Findlay who had done the same kind of thing that Jon Snow did uh, with the outbreak of yellow fever as Jon Snow had done with cholera. He mapped it out and he was like, I don't know how this works, but I know it's the mosquitoes. So this was so off the wall that nobody believed him. So uh, the war starts and a lot more troops, as expected, are dying of yellow fever versus, uh, versus bullets. So uh, you have a physician named um, Walter Reed uh, who comes down there and it's his job in order to uh, try and figure this out uh, in order to, to save soldiers, to keep everybody fit to fight. Uh, and so they end up going to this Carlos Finlay guy to basically disprove him because again, nobody has any idea of like how this is going on. And they think this is just some crackpot idea. And so um, a guy named James Carroll uh, decides he's going to start infecting himself and his colleagues and uh, in order to disprove this. And so no doubt this is very brave, but at the same time, they also thought this was kind of a crackpot theory. And meanwhile, Walter Reed has to travel back and forth between Washington and Cuba. And when this guy, James Carroll, ends up dying, uh, they realize that it was, uh, it was the mosquitoes. And so they're able to perform these scientific tests and prove beyond a shadow of a doubt uh, that it is mosquitoes that carry this disease. And again, this is absolutely mind blowing for the people of the time. Like it took a lot of convincing to make that happen. And so mosquito mitigation is something that is built into pretty much every single municipality's public works. And it's because of yellow fever. Uh, and so in 1905, a uh, yellow fever outbreak happens in New Orleans. And New Orleans thinks they have this dialed in because they've been lucky for the last 20 years. They have this quarantine system that they're very, very uh, proud of. Uh, but they have a doctor that harps on them and harps on them. And they finally, like us bodies start to drop. Um, they end up asking the federal government for help. And they go in and they fumigate. They take every piece of standing water and they dump it out, um, like in these little rain barrels right here, because that's where people were getting their rainwater. They would float kerosene on top of it, or they would you know, put a screen over it and they were able to mitigate this and uh, basically make yellow fever a non-issue up until uh, the 1930s when they got a vaccine. And that brings us to the end of our uh, romp over the wide open blue and its relationship with the sea. Wow, Jordan. That was wow. That's a lot. It's a whole lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's a lot. So, you know, I guess uh, things are better now, relatively speaking. We're not drinking our own poop. So that's a plus. Yeah. yeah <laughs> no, there's, there's a lot of there, there's a lot of positives. And I think it's uh, for me, at least um, uh, reading about how people dealt with stuff in the past uh, gives me um, makes me uh, I don't know, like thing. It makes me a little bit braver, makes me feel better, makes me feel a lot more privileged. Uh, about when when I live, 
when I'm living. Um, and it also gives me a lot of hope. People have lived through a lot of hard stuff. Yeah, that's People, the truth. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see if we have any questions coming in. I think it's a really nice evening and people are outside <laughs> enjoying it. Um, I had a few that came up that I asked you while we were talking. Give it a couple more minutes. But yeah, so let's see. Do I have any more questions? I still can't get over that Lazarette thing. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. So is that just, is that on all boats or just on sailboats that we use Lazarette? You know, I think it's, uh, it's one of those terms that if it's a motorboat or a sailboat, like there's a Lazarette, it just for a motorboat or a sailboat or, or a boat versus a ship. Um, it'll look, it'll look pretty different based on what it is. Oh, right. All right, cool. Well, I think that's all that we have for everyone tonight. Um, we're going to be doing these history um, talks based around maritime history most Thursday nights at this time. Um, again, we're going to be looking at some of the stuff that we have exhibited here in the museum um, as of as uh, we move forward and doing uh, lots of other exciting stuff. So thanks for joining us. And thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thanks so much. And, for uh, yeah, we will. Uh, See you again soon. All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.